T-Rex and Get It On, and the piano player on that record is here with us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not the most exciting piano part I've ever played. <laughs> a few little glissandos. I mean, the, the, the story has been told, but, um, oh, crikey, Mark was a great friend. He was a lovely man. And I used to do uh, a lot of work for Regal Zonophone, Denny Cordell, uh, which was at 68 uh, Oxford Street, Dumbarton House. And they used to do demo sessions as well as, as proper sessions. So I used to hang around there to see what I could get and what I couldn't get. And I was living out at Gants Hill near, near Ilford at the time. My rent was £8 a week. I couldn't pa I was really struggling that this particular week and i came to london to see what i could pick up to to work went up to dumbarton house spoke to denny anything no i spoke to uh tony visconti anything no gus dodge and anything no nothing and nothing to direct nothing around i was just about to give up and i went down to the wimpy bar which was on the corner opposite and uh tony visconti came and said you're in luck session tonight i said oh Thank you, God. Wait, well, he said, Trident Studios. He said, uh, Mark, Mark wants you to do some piano. I said, oh, brilliant. So I went down to Trident Studios, and, and Mark, as he always did, came with the guitar and played the, the, the track through. And I'm listening to this, and I said, Mark, um, hard as I can, and listen, I can't see where a piano fits on this. This is, this is a, glam, a glam rock guitar rock track. I, I just don't see the piano. He said, I want you to do some glissandos. He said, just thumb at the top, all the way down. I said, when? He said, when I nod at you. I said, right, okay. And so we paid it through to each other, and I, and I did that. And at the end of the session, that's all I had to do. I said, um, I said, Mark, he said, I said, look, thanks ever so much. So I collected me you know, nine quid, so I, I made a pound, because I was paying everything. So I was, you know, to get back on the train, central line, go back to Gantz. So I said, look, thanks ever so much. <laughs> I said, but I've got to, I said, you could do this yourself. Anybody could have done this. And uh, he said, yeah, you wanted your rent though, didn't you? And I, he said, uh, if I'd have offered you the money, he said, you wouldn't have taken it. So you've earned it. Wonderful. Then, of course, you got a phone call from David Bowie. Yeah. And I lived in a tiny little house in uh, in West Harrow. Uh, I, I mean, really tiny little terrace place. And he called me up and said, would you come and come and see me? I want to play you some songs. So I went up and he opened his guitar case and took out this incredibly battered 12-string guitar and started playing these songs, one after the other. Sensational songs, you know, you know, changes and uh, and uh, you know, then life on Mars, of course, and all the other songs which will, will eventually became Hunky Dory. And I, he said, "What do you think?" Oh, I said, "Dave, these are sensational." Normally on an album, uh, that you, you would have, you know, maybe one cracking song, a, a couple of other good ones, and then there will be, with, without being detrimental to other artists, a little bit of padding here. Well, this song will that'll be all right and, and get lost, but it was just cracking song after cracking song and i said these are amazing and he said um what i want you to do he says make notes about them on piano so almost treat them as piano pieces because i want to come at this album from the piano point of view so he said what i want you to do is to do really what you want to do and i'll get uh, mick and the rest of the guys and woody to work round you which is always been a bit embarrassing because people have said to me, God, you must have worked so hard to do those arrangements for like Life on Mars and then I go, well, actually the truth is everybody had to work around me. People often ask me, did you know it, you know, it was going to be as, as huge as it was? The answer is yes. You, I did loads and loads of sessions, a couple of thousand of them over the years. And the thing was, when something very special came up, you did know. You really did know that this. And... Uh, you always knew that Hunky Dory was going to be an iconic album and, and live forever because of the songs on it and, and and how David approached making the album. Life on Mars is something I'm very proud to have uh, been involved with it, very proud to have been given the opportunity to play on it. I've always wondered, at the end of Life on Mars, it sounds like a phone rings in a studio. Yeah. I mean, what, what was that all about? The actual performing studio, the live room, was downstairs at, at Trident, and upstairs was the control room. And I was told whether or not it's true or not, probably Tony Visconti is the only one who could answer the question, really, was that uh, the phone rang up there, and there was a sort of a door open, and somehow it leaked downstairs onto a, onto a mic, and for whatever reason, like a lot of quirky things on records, I'll leave it. 
All right. Well, we'll listen out uh, for the phone ringing at the end. I've always loved that little that yeah. little quirk, and and it has captured the moment. That's why it's good to sometimes leave um, these absolutely, things. Absolutely, yeah. But before that, the wonderful piano playing of Rick Wakeman on Life on Mars. Life on Mars from David Bowie. Rick Wakeman's here on Radio 2. So when was the beginning of Yes for you? When did you get involved there? Well, the first time I, I sort of heard Yes was, um, 69, probably. I did a, uh, I was with Straubs at the time, and we ended up supporting Yes at a show in Hull. Uh, and after we'd done our 40-minute opener, I, I hung around to hear this to actually well, hear and see this band that you know, people had started to sort of talk about. And what intrigued me at the time was um, it broke every single, or virtually every single rule about what a rock band should be. I mean, at that time, the, um, the lead guitarist always had a massive stack of Marshall amps and Marshall cabinets, was, you know, incredibly loud. The guitarist came on, Steve Howe, and he had two little Fender twin amps. And, in, and instead of having a, a Les Paul or a, or a Strat or a Telecaster, he had um, a, a, a Gibson semi-acoustic. thought, what? Chris Squire, the bass player, came on. No Marshall stacks there. He had Sun cabinets, which nobody had ever heard of, uh, playing probably what was considered to be the most unfashionable bass there was, which was the Rickenbacker. And, of course, then there was Bill Bruford who played unlike any drummer I'd ever heard. The only thing I suppose that was normal was, uh, was, was Tony, Tony Kay, who had a Hammond organ and played uh, very, very well, like a, a, a rock organist. And then out came the singer. Normally singers were about six foot, long greasy black hair, and strutted around in leathers. Out came this little pixie, about f five foot two tall, and when he opened his mouth had the most glorious alto voice. And I'm like, what is going on? This is absolutely, it breaks every single rule about rock and roll. And it was a couple of months, two or three months after that, that I got a phone call at two o'clock in the morning from Chris Squire, um, who is, he is a night bird, bless him. And he said they just got back from America after doing their first tour out there, and they were looking at having a few changes around as, as to their music and to how they wanted to develop and they wanted to develop very much along the orchestral lines uh, and they heard me play with Straubs because they saw me at that at that particular gig in Hull Tony very much wanted to stay in the in the rock stream of things uh, so was going to leave would I be interested in in coming along it was interesting because there were five completely different people in every possible respect and it was a classic example of five people who had probably absolutely nothing in common with each other outside of music and what we were trying to do and before you ask me i'm not sure that any of us really knew what we were trying to do we just found that we each had elements that if we brought brought it to the table somehow slotted together and we each had elements of uh i suppose of of musical gifts in different uh, that we could make work to make them to make the music work keyboards were growing at the time um, people like bob moog had created great instruments that were coming through and and i i was having the most wonderful time you know creating a keyboard orchestra around uh these great players and great music and which track would you say you played on with Yes, where you thought, yes, this is it, it's all come together, this is how I imagined it, this is... Well, I suppose, well, Close to the Edge um, were, were, was, was very, very special, obviously, um, as was, I suppose, and you and I on Fragile Roundabout was just a, a classic mixture of track of sort of prog rock and rock, and uh, where it almost meets commercialism without trying to in a strange way. Rick, it's been great seeing you. It's been fantastic seeing you. Thanks for coming in. And listen, have a wonderful time with the shows. I hope to see you there, sir. You will indeed. Thanks.